awesome. Wow. Thank you very much. Wow, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? You got everything you need to know about happiness and you're done. Yes. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm not sure about which intrinsic goal is more dominant or more important necessarily, but I do know that there are a lot more intrinsic goals than what, what we just covered. That was just the three that they studied. But um, the idea, the, the principle is, is that's fascinating to me is that what you care about has a huge impact on your happiness. Right? Like we cannot all become rich and famous and young and beautiful and talented and strong or whatever we want to be, but we can choose to care about people. We can choose to be a good friend. You know, so so that's, that's what was interesting to me. In terms of the personal growth, that's one that works for a lot of people, but other people don't need that. Andy Wimmer, at the end of the film in India, he didn't need that. He doesn't need to become a great Andy Wimmer. He needs to serve people. So the, the, the values are different that work for different people. But, Importantly, yes, it's, it's simply that, that what you choose to focus on has a huge impact on your happiness. Even, you know, whether you achieve the goals or not, that's the part that's not in the film that blew me away. If you value money, power, fame, good looks, if those are your priorities, whether you achieve them or not, you are less likely to be happy than if you value friendship, community, wanting to make the world a better place. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, happiness is not out of our reach. It doesn't mean that some people are not clinically depressed. It doesn't mean that some people don't need medical intervention. That absolutely, there is, there's truth to that. But most of us, most of the time, can have a significant impact on our happiness, which is simply just how we decide to see the world, how we, how we ch choose to, to think about things. I'm not, I didn't answer your question at all. I apologize, you just got me on a roll. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, and, and the key to that is yes, there is no single formula for happiness that works for all of us. That, that's right. Yes, sir. Here comes a mic so that the people, our, our uh, can, extended can audience, hear yeah, okay. can hear us. Yeah, so um, you covered this, the subject very well, I must Thank say, and, um, and in such a nice, broad, even, balanced way. Keep I talking. Just, okay. <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> And uh, you touched a lot of nerves, too, at the same time. Um, so my question is, what made you want to create such a great movie like this? Wow. That's a loaded question in all the right ways. First of all, thank you very much. Um, that means a lot. Like I mentioned, it took me six years to make the movie. So imagine how bad it would be if after six years, people were like, that sucked. <laughs> Which I'm sure some people think that, but thankfully, most people have not told me that. The ones that I think hate it, they usually don't stick around and ask questions. Um, what made me want to make it? I feel extremely fortunate in life, just period. I just feel lucky. So uh, my parents are from Eastern Europe. They both fled. Uh, one fled uh, communist uh, oppression. The other one fled uh, you know, economic hardship in Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. Um, I've traveled, I, when I was 20, when I was in college, I took a year and a half off of school. I saved up some money painting houses and I traveled for a year around the world. Um, very, very cheaply, uh, you know, sleeping in parks and stuff and, and, and having a great adventure. But one thing I learned in every place I went is uh, we have a lot to be grateful for that we don't think about, that we take for granted. And we have a lot to learn from other cultures, which is part of the reason why the film was shot in so many different countries. Um, it, it's easy in America to feel like, oh, we got everything. We got iPhones, we have cars, we have electricity, we're set. But there's a lot of wisdom that exists in other cultures that I wanted to share. But I guess my main motivation is simply that, uh, like Andy Wimmer, the reason why I love that line, you know, my life is a, is a gift from God and I want to give it back but with interest, or a loan from God. Um, I, I, that's very inspiring to me. And I feel like uh, I, have, I have basically mooched off the world most of my life 
You know what I mean? My mom raised me, or my dad did too. I had friends and family, I had schools. All these things that I didn't build myself, I benefited from. Technology, science, movie cameras, you know, all kinds of stuff. So if I can give something back, then that's absolutely what I want to do. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's, um, it's extremely rewarding and it's an intrinsic goal. That, that's one of the ones that works for me, is feeling like I'm doing something meaningful for somebody else. And, and it's interesting, I do not volunteer at soup kitchens, and I, um, I did not spend eight months at the Home for the Dying like one of my friends did who told me about Andy Wimmer. He was there, by the way, when we interviewed him for 17 years. It's not like a fad for him. It's not a summer vacation. 17 years, that's his life. Um, so I don't, something in me, I don't, I don't resonate doing those things, but I, in my movies, that's what I want to do. I love movies, and it's very selfishly gratifying, too. I love making movies. And Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, cool, yeah. I just want to piggyback on that and just say thank you so much for shining consciousness on purposeful happiness. Mm. It doesn't always happen for people, and mm. you portrayed it so well with showing people who went through tragedies mm. and who people who have nothing. Right. Um, so I want to say thank you very much for that. And I know a lot of young people are suffering from anxiety and stress, mm. and it's just mind-boggling. They have everything. Right. And these people have nothing, and right. yet they're happy. So that, That's one of the lessons I learned going to India and going to places in Asia and Africa, and obviously places in America. There are plenty of places in America where people are suffering. There are people in this room who are suffering. All of us have suffered. The truth is nobody avoids suffering. Nobody avoids struggle. There's no such person I've ever met, except maybe when my baby was born. But even the birth was pretty painful, I think, for them. They are crying. So nobody avoids suffering. Um, the key is that we can become resilient. We can increase our resilience in a way that's really, uh, it's a win-win because happiness, you know, being happy benefits you and other people, right? Some people have said to me, do you worry that happiness is selfish? You know, now the world is messed up. We need, there are economic problems. There's racial strife still. There's a religious conflict. You know, is your personal happiness something that's selfish? And actually, thankfully, uh, one thing I discovered that, that really inspired me is that happiness is good for you, but it's good for your community as well. And so your happiness is actually important. If you care about your friends, uh, if you want your family to be happier, you need to take care to some extent of yourself. And, and so for me, that's my selfish excuse of why I go surfing a lot. I surf, uh, which is really fun. But, you know, it releases dopamine and it gets me into flow. And I, there's all, now I have scientific basis for why I love to surf. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, here's a mic. So, sorry, microphone. One of the things I think I learned when I was younger was attitude is everything. Mm. I think there's a lot of obviously negative things going around the world today. Mm. So I think when you approach something, having a positive attitude will help you rebound, like I said in the movie, from these negative things that go on in our life. Mm. If you continue to be negative, you have to look on the opposite side of the coin once in a while right. and see what's positive. And the other thing that I find over the years is uh, learning to laugh at yourself. Yes. That's the main thing. Don't take yourself too seriously. Absolutely. And you'll go a long way. That, that works for me. I think those are great tips. Um, I, I met Melissa Moody, who was the woman who was run over by a truck. Uh, I met her because of a, mutual, a friend of a friend was writing a book on optimism. And all, lots of data shows that optimism and happiness go hand in hand. And so, uh, you know, my friend said, you guys have to meet. And we met. We had a great lunch. And, and there was a moment where we exchanged happiness and optimism business cards. And it was just, it felt like the sky sort of parted. <laughs> um, and, and he said, look, we had such a great talk. Why don't you just come with me? I have to interview somebody for my book. Um, but I don't want to leave yet, so why don't you just come with me? And, and for the next hour and a half, I heard him interview Melissa Moody. And that's how she came into the film. And that, that um, to deviate a little bit from what you were talking about, that is how I found the subjects for my films, or for this film. Uh, really random, very open. Um, and, and that's part of why I love making movies and why I choose to do this, because as a lifestyle, as, a, as an experience, it's really enjoyable. Um, it's also very frustrating. I don't know if making movies is, is very tedious and technical, and the computer is always crashing, and the hard drives are crashing, and I swear at my computer a lot. I shouldn't say that as a guy with a happy shirt on, but I do. Um, <laughs> So, so and, and it gets back to the idea that struggle and, you know, that's not something you're seeking to avoid necessarily. You're just, you just need, I think we need to figure out just how to deal with it when it happens, because we cannot avoid it. Um, so I swear on my computer, and then I love my computer the next day.
Uh, yes, ma'am. When it does affect uh, make happy, I agree. Oh, oh sorry. But, uh, in Germany, it's a proverb. You can, pro you can cry better with money. <laughs> oh, yeah, in Germany, the proverb is but you can cry I better with money. I that's, personally that's good. feel good and happy when I do something good for somebody else. Yes. If somebody is happy, I feel good for him. Right. And I'm really sorry for people who don't have this feeling. Right. They go to church to show their clothes, but they wouldn't do anything good. Yes. I feel sorry for these people. I think there are people who uh, are not connected. They don't recognize that they don't, uh, it's, it's easier for all of us actually to be mistaken about where our happiness comes from sometimes. So uh, we are trained, we're literally bombarded with messages by extremely talented creative people who work in advertising to, to believe that s buying certain products or, or, or doing certain things with our money will make us happy. And I know that's kind of a common thing that we all sort of rail against, but, but as an art student, that's what I did when I was in college, I was shocked to discover that the main pathway, the main pathway towards a working career for art students in the school I was at at least, was to go into advertising. And I thought about it, I thought, well, advertising means that you're convincing people to buy stuff, basically, or, or purchase things, or rent things, or pay for things that they don't necessarily want before they see your ad. And that doesn't seem like a great way to use the human resource of our nation, or even our society. Creative people, I think, have a lot more potential than that. So, um, but I want to get back to your proverb that uh, it's easier to cry with money. Uh, it's one thing that's very important to not lose sight of, that economic um, uh, stability, some amount of base material needs do need to be met for most of us to f be able to find happiness. So when you are suffering, when you're really struggling, it, money means a lot. You know, if, if it means that you, uh, that it, you will find uh, something to eat that night or some way to feed your kids or a safe place to sleep, it means a lot. It's just that for the rest of us, the curve, the, it begins to curve. It doesn't go, it's not a, a line that goes straight up in terms of relationship. Well, the poor people maybe are happier. You go to Africa, the little children, they play with cans or forks or something. Right. What they find on the street and they are happy. And our, we don't have that, we don't have that yes. in the fridge. Fridge yeah. is full with everything. Uh, we yeah, take a lot for granted. It. Yeah, we take a lot for granted. Actually, one of the inspirations also to make this movie, one of the reasons why I said yes to Tom immediately when he suggested we make a movie about happiness is that I did go to East Africa when I was 18. I went to Kenya and Tanzania and Malawi and South Africa. And as an 18-year-old who had only been to Europe and America, um, it was mind-blowing. And it was mind-blowing in all these ways that I didn't expect. I was going with a group of kids who had raised money for refugees of a civil war, a brutal civil war in Mozambique where people didn't just kill each other, but they cut each other's arms off, they cut people's lips off, their noses, their ears, and left them alive to traumatize their relatives and their community members. So I was preparing myself emotionally before I went on this trip to, to, to deal with this horrible hell that we were going to immerse ourselves into. And in fact, what I saw was the exact opposite. People were dancing, they were happy, they were curious, they were laughing, they were, they were excited. Now we were, as foreigners, of course, we stimulated something because it was, we were more interesting than what was going on every day, but it showed me that there were people who had literally nothing. I mean, there were kids whose butts were hanging out of their shorts because they had worn holes in their, in their shorts, and they had no underwear on, they had no socks, no shoes, no shirts, and yet they were happier than many of the friends that I knew back home who, like you said, had everything. So that is a question I had since I was 18. How is that possible that this material disparity does not result in an emotional disparity that you would expect? Um, and I think we were able to explore that question. You have to be optimist. Don't look at the bad side of life and say, well, it could be worse. I achieved this and that. Yes, yes. There are many, many different paths, and, and that's the beauty of it. Does anybody else have a question? Anyone? Yes, in the back. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you. I'm a psychologist and run the wellness center here. So you made my guest lectures much more interesting with this film over Great. the last few years. Um, the students really love the gorillas particularly. That's always yes. the highlight of the, the guest lecture. Um, my question is in the last few years, I've seen a lot of pushback um, on happiness and happiness as a field. I've seen it sort of ebb and flow over the years with positive psychology and Martin Seligman initially, and then it kind of 
sure. goes in waves. Um, but in in the last few years, it's it's become, especially in academia and in uh, popular culture, there's been a lot more pushback, mostly on the hedonic parts of it and all of the the excesses. Mm. Um, when that is such a a criticism of our younger generation. And I'm mm. curious about any pushback you faced going around talking about this film and talking about happiness, or if you have any well, thoughts on what that pushback is about currently. Well, I mean, in terms of the pushback, uh, one of my friends is Robert Diener, who is the son of Ed Diener, who's the guy in the red shirt with the brown parted hair, who's, who's he's probably the father or grandfather, whatever you want to call it, of the field of positive psychology. He studied it for about 35 years. Uh, he didn't coin the term, but, uh, but his son is known as the Indiana Jones of happiness research because Ed wanted data. He, wa he loves crunching data, and he wanted to find out more about happiness around the world. And a lot of grad students, amazingly, did not want to go to the jungles of Africa or to the, the deserts of the Middle East to get data, and Robert was totally game for it. Um, so Robert has written a book recently about the benefits of pleasure and hedonic pleasure, the things that... I guess what it gets at is none of these things are true as in set in stone for everybody all the time. But pleasure, there is a certain role for that. We shouldn't, you know, there's some, Mother Teresa apparently said, give until it hurts and then give some more. That formula doesn't work for a lot of people. For her, maybe it did. And she also struggled. But for a lot of us, we need to kind of breathe a little bit. We need to do yoga or play basketball or hang out with your friends or watch a silly movie. We need to sort of decompress. And I am an advocate of that, that like I mentioned about surfing uh, and other things that I like to do. So, um, but the, the pushback I got was mainly about, uh, is it superficial? Is your happiness selfish? And in fact, when I, you know, when I learned that happiness um, happy people work better, they're better students, they have better peer reviews, uh, you know, they're more creative, they're more likely to help people in need, they're less likely to pollute the environment, they're less likely to want to go to war, they're less likely to commit crimes. It's like, no, this is not a superficial subject at all. This, is, this basically gets at everything that I care about at, the core, at, at one of the core levels. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, editing room floor, you guys, it's like it's 400 hours of footage. We just saw a one-hour movie. That is a terribly inefficient shooting ratio. <laughs> there are 399 hours on my hard drives. Um, actually, on the DVD, we did put about another 33 minutes of stuff. There are a few stories. And what we watched today is a slightly abridged version. So this is a 55-minute version. The sort of director's cut is a 75 minutes, so there are a few stories that were not in here. And then on the DVD, there's a few extras. Um, but the essence of what I wanted to say, the essence of the 400 hours is in here. I mean, th these are the subjects. Uh, there are details, for example, and this isn't even in the long version, but happiness is contagious. So there was an article in the New York Times about a bunch of uh, research that was done that showed that there are three degrees of separation from your own happiness. So if you are happy, your friends are likely to be happy, and your family, people who know you. Their friends who have never met you are likely to be happier if you're happy. And your friends, friends, friends are more or less likely to be happy depending on your happiness. People who have never met you and never will. Isn't that amazing? But it kind of makes sense, right? You walk in a room and somebody's all grumpy and they're complaining about their job or they're complaining about their husband or wife or whatever, their kids. And you just sometimes, it, if they're just angry, you just you feel it and you go, oh, I'd rather not deal with that right now. You know, it just it, it sticks on you a little bit because we're naturally empathic, right? That's actually a sign of a, it's a, one of the beautiful uh, aspects of human nature is that we are empathic. We do feel each other's pain and joy. But to three degrees is pretty awesome. So when you yell at somebody, you are yelling at their friends and their friends' friends and their friends' friends' friends. <laughs> and when you laugh with somebody, it's the same thing. Um, yes, sir. I'd like to like, just add on to what you're speaking about right now. Sure. Did you, you know, you're doing a film on happiness, but did you see anything about, did, hap did happiness pull people up or did unhappiness pull people down Mm. And what had the greater effect? Mm. Obviously, you were only experience showing happiness, but right. you had to experience 
unhappiness in there too, and did that have a great effect on the cultures? Yes. Um, in terms of on a cultural level, uh, I, I Actually, not cultural level, personal level. Take cultural level even down a down a aspect of like your friends, you know, your right, immediate right. culture. Well, you know, as as you ask the questions, they're both they're good questions, and I didn't focus on unhappiness. I figured that's what the newspaper's for. Um, and I mean that in a positive way. A friend of mine is a journalist for New York Times and I read his stories and, and that's what I want to change in the world when I read about injustice. Um, and again, that's one thing. You know, I actually got depressed for a little while or depression is a too strong a word. My friend was kidnapped in Iraq as a journalist. And I thought, and this is when they were cutting people's heads off. And I thought, shit, this guy is risking his life to tell people's stories, to give a voice to people who otherwise would be voiceless, people whose voice needs to be heard by an empathic human community. And I thought, he's doing that, and what am I doing? I'm sitting in an air-conditioned editing room, you know, swearing at my computer sometimes. It's, am I doing enough? Um, and that gets back to when I discovered that research that showed how you know, happy people are less likely to commit crimes and cut people's heads off and hate people because of their religion or their sexual orientation or whatever. So um, I, I don't know exactly if unhappiness is more powerful than happiness. Um, I think waves, you know, ebbs and flows happen within families, within friendship groups, uh, you know, groups of friends. You, you know, you kind of sometimes there are happier times and, and less happy. Um, but I guess that just through all that, regardless, uh, I am very empowered and inspired by the idea that a person can make a big impact just by literally just by going surfing, just by gardening, just by hanging out with a good friend of yours, by prioritizing something that genuinely makes you happy. Win-win. Anyone else? Yes. Right, Sorry, so I have to ask, but wrong. with six years invested, you know, yeah. are you happy? I am, I am. Like I said, if, if you guys all were booing and kind of leaving while the movie was playing and kind of going, ah, it sucked, and there was, the room was empty by the end, then it would be horrible. That would, that would, but like Daniel Gilbert said, I would be devastated, but I'd be devastated for a very short time. Probably. Uh, I'd, then I'd paint houses again, uh, which was fun, actually. Uh, <laughs> anyone else, you guys? Actually, I have a question from the live stream. Okay, from the world. The greater yes. world. Let's see here. Oh, it's long. Um, Cornelia Pellman asks, how does a society create a government mm. like that in Bhutan whose duty it is to maximize happiness? Can you give details on how Bhutan created a society whose focus is on maximizing happiness, mm. GNH? She's looking for examples of how a nation would change its focus from GNP to GNH. Sure, sure. Um, I have all the answers, by the way, to the world's problems. Um, no, it's a, it's a very good question, and it's, it's the kind of question that I have myself, because, okay, I know how to make movies, but that not everybody's going to see this, and not everybody can enact a change because of this, at least not at, a, at some sort of municipal or you know, federal level. Um, one thing that's very exciting about Bhutan is it is a country that almost, well, I shouldn't say it quite like this, but a lot of people have never heard of until this happened. So that tiny country, it's sort of the example of one person, that little country that is not an economic powerhouse, that it does not have a Hollywood movie uh, business that, that goes around the world, um, it has humble monks, and it has wonderful people, and simple farmers, and, and smart you know, academics. It just has a it's, a, it's a, it's a place like any other. We could all do what they're doing. But by, by stepping out and saying, this is what we want to prioritize, they have become an international symbol of a new process, a new thought process for government. And so the answer to that question, I th part of the answer is that government leaders from around the world have gone to Bhutan to study how are they doing this. And by the way, Bhutan has not figured it all out. It's not necessarily the happiest country in the world. Not everybody there is happy. But they're working on it in a way that I think is, is correct, which is they're recognizing the idea that economic prosperity does not always lead to happiness for all people. I mean, we know that people who are volunteering for ISIS, some of them come from wealthy, educated families who have, quote unquote, everything they need, and yet they're doing something very radical in a very negative and destructive way. So money does not necessarily work for all of us. But you know, 
I think 150 years ago, or even at the founding of this country, that made sense because everybody was poor. You know, there's some countries where almost everybody's poor, and economic growth does make a huge difference to people at the bottom of the economic spectrum. So uh, in terms of the governments, um, one thing is simply to advocate for it, obviously. Uh, to do it locally, locally there are, um, there are organizations in Seattle and Santa Monica and actually cities around the world who are embracing some of these happiness um, governmental concepts. So this is all easily Googleable, internetable, you know, searchable. So, um, so the answers are out there and I unfortunately don't have all the answers right now, right here. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I just read an article that said Bhutan, uh, the people there, they try to think about death or they reflect upon death and they, um, yeah. So did that come up in your 40 hours of filming or anything it, like that? It did. It did. First of all, the, for the people in the rest of the world, you can't see this wonderful smile. What's your name? Julie. Julie. Julie has a wonderful smile. You see, smiles, by the way, and people have told me that even just seeing my shirt, Makes them literally. People have said that makes me happy. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, Julie's smile makes me happy. So, uh, in terms of um, considering your death, so Saint Francis is often depicted in paintings holding a skull, because he said that when we recognize that we're all mortal, when we recognize that we're not going to be here forever, it shifts some things. In the same way that somebody gets cancer, God willing, they pull through it and they reevaluate what's important in their lives. Near-death experiences do that, and we can do that without the near-death experience. You can just literally think about it, or you can think about your friends who have passed away. For me, that's valuable. Um, for other people, it's depressing and scary, and they don't want to deal with it. Uh, I think it's very important to recognize I'm not going to be here forever. So, fundamental question, do I want to suffer or do I want to flourish? Of course, I want to flourish in some way. Um, you know, how do I want to do that? Well, I love making movies. So, so that's, for me, it helps calibrate things. Pondering death is subjective in terms of its positive impact. And I think Bhutan, because of the Buddhist traditions there, um, they, they may do that more as a, as a society. They also, by the way, have phallic symbols all over their monasteries, which most people don't know until you see a traditional Buddhist monastery with a huge, like, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. But it, it actually, it's, it's totally part of that same conversation. It's about life, and generation, genesis, and death. It's about that that's all we get. We get this cycle. And then maybe you believe in reincarnation. And that's a whole other fun Ferris wheel of thought. Anyone else? I have another question from the yes. World Wide Web. Okay. Um, from Cynthia Frazier. She would like you to discuss a little about the production of the film and talk about what you're working on next. Cynthia, thank you. Um, let's see, the production of the film is, I guess, uh, broad strokes. Tom said, would you want to make this movie? I said, sure. He said, I'll help you pay for it. So that helps a lot. <laughs> Making independent documentaries is usually an extreme struggle. Amazingly, I still managed to spend six years doing it. Um, but so Tom was funding it. So we came up with a budget. We did all kinds of research. Um, one of my questions was, well, if being a you know, rich and famous movie director doesn't make you happy, what does, what careers do? And I followed around a hospice nurse for three months because counterintuitively, hospice nurses are among the happiest careers. Uh, right, hospice nurse, I, didn't, I wasn't even sure what hospice nurse meant, but it means you're, you're, your patients are dying. There is no cure for whatever condition they have, and they usually die within days, weeks, or months. Everybody goes, ah, oh, must be so depressing. This woman, Janice Bell, who is on the DVD extras, um, walks into a house when the family is distraught, they're losing a loved one, and she's got answers, and she has pain medication, and she tells jokes, and within two minutes, the whole room is laughing, and she, she feels extremely fulfilled by her ability to play that role in people's lives in a time of need. Um, so we went around, we shot tons of footage, we thought about what countries, what stories, would make sense, like Namibia. I, I had known that Namibian, oh, we didn't see the Namibian Bushmen here, sorry. Um, there's a section I shot in, in Southwest Africa and Namibia because uh, there's a group of people who are culturally and even have genetic tracings that are more, clo more closely linked to our ancient ancestors than anybody else in the world. 
And, and since the culture has remained somewhat intact, I wanted to see what made us happy before advertising and cars and, and cell phones and all that. So we've picked all these things. We said, what would be really cool to do? And we did a lot of them, 400 hours worth. And then we spent years editing. And uh, my editor is named Vivian Hillgrove, who actually worked on one floor of the cuckoo's nest. She's 400 years, no, I'm just kidding. She's not that old, but she's, she's a wonderful, talented editor. So then you just slog through it. So making a film the way that I make it, because we did not have a deadline, and that's one thing I decided after art school or going to studying art is I didn't like deadlines. Um, maybe that was the worst decision I made. But, uh, but it means that we had a lot of creative freedom. We slogged through all this footage. We felt what was powerful, and then you kind of hone it down. You hone it down. You have you know, a three-hour version and then a two-hour version. And, and so I don't know if that really explains, Cynthia, what the production was like, but it was pretty freestyle, and there were not many people involved. There was no big studio. There was nobody. Um, there was, it was a handful, three, four of us most of the time. The other part of Cynthia's question was, what's yeah. next? What are oh, you, yeah, what, what is next? So next? I am working on a project that I can't talk about too much, um, just to remain mysterious. No, um, and, and alluring. No, uh, I, I don't want to talk about it because I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be. But it is a very inspiring true story, or based on a true story, of somebody who, um, whose life uh, went through the worst hell a person can imagine and um, has figured out a way to flourish in a way that uh, even makes me envious. Does that make any sense? And it's shot in another country. Okay, so yes. Final question, where do you get the happy shirts? The happy shirts, I thought you'd never ask. Um, <laughs> no, the happy shirts, uh, first of all, by the way, I think the world has too much stuff in it. I almost said a swear word, stuff. Uh, so we did make these on organic cotton, if that makes any difference to anybody. They are available on our website, um, and I don't think they're in any stores anymore, but I'm not sure. The website, thehappymovie.com. And there's a bunch of other resources if you want about books and other, other things. Um, you should have used a motto from the Free Guys, or a card game once. Happiness is a warm puppy. Happiness is a warm puppy, that's right. Well, you know, uh, the gentleman mentioned the motto from the Peanuts cartoon. One thing I really did not want to do with this movie is make a movie about people's opinions of happiness, because we all have them, even Snoopy. Um, we all have opinions, and, and that, that can get us only so far, but there's always a counter opinion. I wanted to find out what the science was telling us. And, and so that's really why I was, uh, I just so happened when I first searched it that there was, you know, I found this positive psychology. It just got, it sort of the timing was right. Um. Is that it, guys? I'm going to hang out for a little while, too, so if anybody has questions that are too embarrassing to ask in public, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Stay up here. Okay. joining us. We're going to have the opportunity to ha now have a little reception outside in the beautiful weather. But I just want to thank you for sharing this six-year journey with us. And thank I know you. that so many members of the Dickinson community have been inspired by what you've learned. And our dining services apparently was so inspired that they baked you these special happy cookies. That is awesome. Yeah. Happiness is a smiley face happiness. cookie. Thank you. Yeah. I think thank happiness so is a cookie. Yes. But I think, uh, you know, actually, I think your documentary is one that can be watched many times mm. because I think it's something, you can learn something new from it each time you see it. Thank, Thank you. you all again, and please join us outside. Thank you. That is awesome. Okay. Okay.